Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut with your host, Rebecca Coombs. On today's show of the Healthy Gut Podcast, I am joined by the queen of SIBO, Dr. Alison Seebecker. And she is a respected naturopathic physician who has brought SIBO into the limelight of alternative and complementary medicine. She was also the co-founder and former medical director of the SIBO Centre for Digestive Health at MCNM Clinic. And she specialised in the treatment of SIBO since 2010. This is the first part of a two-part uh, episode with Dr. Seebecker. And we go deep into all things SIBO. What I find fascinating is that Dr. Seebecker herself has SIBO. She's had methane-dominant SIBO. So she knows firsthand exactly what it's like to suffer from this chronic illness. And it is a chronic illness. She discusses that with us around how two-thirds of all SIBO cases are chronic. So it becomes about managing the condition more than curing the condition. We talk about what it is um, and interestingly that it is normal bacteria, not pathogenic bacteria that is causing the problem. And many people believe there are multiple causes for SIBO, but actually Dr. Becker talks to me about how there's only just a few small uh, number of causes but there are multiple risk factors that can lead to the cause of SIBO, and we discuss what they are. You can also have a mild case of SIBO all the way through to a severe case of SIBO, and we go through the types of symptoms that you might experience, things like bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, gas. But interestingly as well, she says that it almost always goes with food intolerances. We also talk about the mental side and emotional side of dealing with SIBO because quite often we're focused on our physical symptoms, but there's so much more that can happen with it. We go through the tests, what are accurate tests and what perhaps are not such accurate tests for testing for SIBO. And then we discuss the treatment options. So things like um, antibiotics, herbal antibiotics, the elemental diet, and why it can take multiple rounds of different types of treatments to actually get your SIBO under control, or if you're one, the lucky one third, to actually get rid of your SIBO. And I ask her that all important question, should we starve or feed our bacteria during, during treatment? We look at the diet options because that I know for so many of you is such an important part of your SIBO journey and which ones you should follow and why reducing carbohydrates can actually leave you feeling significantly better. But conversely, eating lots of carbohydrates, in Dr. Alison Seebecker's opinion, won't cause your SIBO. Now, I will just put a, a precursor to you listening to the podcast that we had a few audio issues, so unfortunately the audio quality isn't the best. Uh, but there's amazing content in here, so I do hope that you will uh, listen through some of the glitches with the audio quality um, to an incredible interview with the Queen of SIBO, Dr. Alison Seebecker. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Alison Seebecker. Hi. <laughs> it's so great to have you on the Healthy Gut podcast talking all about SIBO today. So I'd love to talk to you, Alison, about your story, how you came to be uh, such an expert on the topic of SIBO. Right. Pretty sad. Although I will say that I don't refer to myself as an expert because I find that term intimidating <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, then it makes people think that another person who is an expert knows everything and I don't and no, neither does anybody. But so I prefer the term specialist. Specialist. <laughs> it, okay. It takes the pressure off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my story is that I, I was born without GI symptoms, but when I was very young, I got GI symptoms probably around the age of five. And I suffered from them, and mostly it was um, bloating, abdominal bloating, constipation, and pain. Not all the time, but a goodly amount of pain. And I had these on, ongoing 
my whole life. And I, I didn't even know that I had a diagnosable disorder until I was in medical college. Right. And it, then it got diagnosed as IBS, mm-hmm. which isn't all that helpful uh, because before a lot of this information of SIBO was, was well known, um, all that we knew about IBS is that, you know, you have, all it meant was that you have those symptoms that I just described, or maybe diarrhea, and we don't know why, and we don't know what to do for it. Exactly. <laughs> so it's yep. like, it's like, great. <laughs> Thanks so <laughs> much. So much help. Right? And, and the doctor gave me a few things to try, and I did try them, and they didn't help. So... Um, so anyway, there I was suffering from, you know, a, a chronic illness and it, and it really, at times it would be debilitating to me. And then at other times it, I was all right. So then I'm, I'm in college and uh, my gastroenterology professor had this recommended reading list and on it was Breaking the Vicious Cycle by Elaine Gottschall, mm-hmm. which describes the specific carbohydrate diet. And I read it and I thought that what she was talking about might have been what I had wrong with me. And she was talking about small intestine bacterial overgrowth, but she didn't call it by that name. Um, she, but she used those words, you know, bacteria overgrow in the small intestine. And what she was trying to do was she was trying to explain why the specific carbohydrate diet worked for her daughter who had inflammatory bowel disease and why it worked for um, all the people that it that it worked for, which are mostly people with infl- um, inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease. And so her theory, one of her theories that she was putting forward in the book was that, well, maybe really what it was treating was SIBO mm-hmm. and the diet, and maybe that's why it worked. Now, just a caveat to that is on the side here is that um, I, I don't think that's that's true. There are lots of people with celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease who don't have SIBO, and the specific carbohydrate diet works for them too. So there's more going on than that. Just mm-hmm. wanted to say that. Sure. But okay. So anyway, I read the, read it, and I was like, oh my gosh, I think this is what I have. I want to do this. But I was in the middle of college, uh, medical school, and it, you know, it's extremely daunting. The hours are extremely long, and I I just I had no more effort to do much about it. So once I graduated. I I was reminded of the book. I was suffering very badly from my symptoms. And I thought, now I'm going to do this. And so I did the diet. And within um, 24 hours, my pain was gone. Wow. um, Which was unbelievable. So, you know, the diet just gave me my life back. And the bloating was was reduced um, a very goodly amount, like maybe 50%. Constipation, it didn't do anything for. But in a way, I didn't really care because it's like, oh, my God, my pain. So this just let lit this fire under me to understand it. I, I, you know, obviously I've been through medical school. I've had the the disease. I wanted to know what this was all about. So then I had this chance encounter with my previous gastroenterology professor and he, um, he mentioned SIBO. Now that, that phrasing wasn't in Elaine Gottschall's book. So he mentioned that phrasing to me and, um, and sort of together, we thought that maybe that's that's really what she was describing, this, this sort of condition that was now being described as SIBO. So I went and started doing research. And so that's what I did. I just threw myself into research. I actually stopped practicing. Um, I was doing primary care. I stopped practicing for uh, over a year, and all I did was research. Okay. I mean, all day long, every day. And then after that, I began teaching. So, um, and so my, my previous gastroenterology professor is Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis, who had, has been my partner in crime, so to speak, ever since. So anyway, then we began teaching after I had studied for over a year, year, year and a half, nonstop, nothing else that I was doing <laughs> day in, day out. <laughs> um, then we began teaching, um, and um, I was encouraged soon after I first taught, I was encouraged to uh, make the website. And the encouragement for that was because the first class that I taught was at the annual um, naturopathic convention in the United States national convention. And there you know, was a, a lot of doctors there and I was getting onslaughted with emails from them and phone calls to answer their questions. Everybody took to the topic like wildfire, you know, they were just totally into it and they had tons of questions and I could not live a life like that where I was just answering all day long for free, everybody's questions. I, I, at one point I tried to do that for two weeks and I worked 80 hours a week wow. um, for two, two weeks straight for free answering the public and um, doctor's questions. So I realized I, I can't do that. So I, I made a website to try and answer the questions. So I spent many months just writing all the information down so people would have a reference. Also, I was um, I was rather outraged that the condition didn't have anything like that. I mean, when I first 
when I first got into SIBO, which was six or I guess seven years, I can't remember now, um, years ago, I tried to find how to test for it. And I typed in all sorts of search terms. And, you know, Quintron, who's the manufacturer of the breath testing machine, they came up like on page three. Right. It was like, it was insane. You could not find anything online, nothing. There was no, you know, there was one Medscape article. So where I had to go to learn about it was into PubMed. And at the time, naturopathic training didn't stress reading like MD uh, research articles on PubMed. Now the schooling has changed and that is very much um, uh, stressed in my school. But back then it wasn't. We went to other sources. Um, and so that was something I had to learn all about. And I guess if I was just sort of to summarize some of those things, basically when I read uh, Breaking the Vicious Cycle, I just had so many more questions, so many more deep questions I wanted to answer for myself. And that's really what spurred me on. And honestly, that's still what spurs me on. There are so many things I don't understand well enough, mm-hmm. <laughs> even though even though after six or seven years of constant study, I understand a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but um I'm still spurred on by that. There's things that I don't understand and I just read and read and I, and it has also led me to befriend most or many of the authors of these articles, reaching out to them in the, um, in, in a kind way so that I'm not a pain, but you know, to, um, to talk with them about, uh, what they're learning and what they know. And so that's another way that I've, I've come to, come to learn. And so I do that all the time. I, I call these amazing, you know, gastroenterologists now because I know so many of them and we Skype or we talk or um, whatever so that I can ask them questions about what they've written mm-hmm. and, and what, what I still don't understand. And, and Alice, then, what, oh, sorry. oh yeah, you, you go ahead. No, I was just going to ask. And, and so at what point in this journey did you, were you able to find treatment options that work, that worked for you? And what did you do as your treatment? (laughs) And by the way, I'm sorry to go on and on so long about it. But um, yeah, so I started with diet, with a specific carbohydrate diet, and that helped, I'd say, 60% overall, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. And then after. And what did you see um, it it actually address in that? What was reduced in that 60%? uh, That was my pain in 24 hours (laughs) right away. Wow. Um, My bloating. Um, got maybe 50% better. Um, and then my overall well-being felt vastly improved. Um, and, and But my constipation wasn't helped. That was not helped. But just not having pain every time I would eat, or most times, it, unbelievable. I mean, you know, it's just... Oh, you know. I can imagine. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so diet first. Then I tried antibiotics um, after long, hard study on those antibiotics to make sure I felt okay taking them. And that took away my constipation, which was incredible because, mm. uh, because it meant that my constipation was created by bacteria if an antibiotic could remove my constipation. Uh, mm-hmm. But like what happens to most people, I relapsed within about two weeks. For some people, it's longer, but for me, um, it was two weeks because I wasn't on a prokinetic. At the time, I, I didn't know about prokinetics, but I was experimenting on myself in all sorts of ways before I would treat patients. I always do that. Yeah. Um, so so then later, I, um, I have repeated antibiotics. I have tried lots of different herbs. Um, and I found uh, one herb, which we know that actually Dr. Jacoby uh, figured out is helpful for methane, which is the Allison products mm-hmm. that actually reduced my bloating. Um, but once again, and I for those re- listeners that haven't heard of Dr. Jacoby, she's actually uh, one of Australia's leading specialists on SIBO. And uh, we're very fortunate to have her in Australia. Yeah, Dr. Jacoby came to that first lecture that I was telling you about that I gave to the National uh, Convention of Naturopaths, and then she yes. contact, contacted me soon after and said, I want to be the SIBO person for Australia, and I was like, fantastic, and then she did a little in-office study, and very soon after that, and she was able to find that Allison, which is an extract from garlic, um, works on methanogens, and this is quite extraordinary because 
uh, there are very few things that work on methanogens. And we, so she found this out a long time ago, and the naturopathic community and everyone else has benefited ever since from, from her figuring that out. So I benefited too. But once again, I And that. Alison, were you a, a methane dominant SIBO person? I was because, uh, because of were. constipation. And I know we could talk about that a little bit later. But, um, yeah. but so since then, I have tried many, you know, different bouts of herbs, different bouts of antibiotics. I myself have not done elemental diet, um, although I have many patients who do it, uh, which is our sort of our third main op- our third main killing option. And I, I still um, have SIBO. I still have symptoms, but I, I'm, I'm one of the more complicated chronic cases. Sometimes I think that the universe is, <laughs> is keeping me with SIBO so that I'll keep studying and I'll figure out for the hardest, hardest cases what I, you know, what needs to know. I try and tell the universe, really, you can take my SIBO away and I will still <laughs> study. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it goes with that. But the thing is, is that, um, I with with a diet and with uh, various treatments periodically, I'm able to uh, stay at a, a level that is acceptable to me. I have live a happy life, so and I'm very productive. So, uh, so yeah, that's my journey. Yeah, that's great, and I think it's it's um, it's good for people who are listening to this podcast to know that um, getting a, a cure or, or ridding yourself of tre- of SIBO may not be what happens for you but it it doesn't mean that life isn't worth living still that you can get it into a position where life can still be pretty good and it's just about managing a chronic illness rather than um looking for a you know that finite point in the future which is where you're you're given the all clear um i'd like to backtrack a little bit sorry oh can i just say one thing on that yeah um, so many people, when they're suffering, when they haven't had treatment yet, and symptoms are at their worst, and, and they discover, you know, okay, this has a name, uh, the idea of not being cured, you know, people have a way of thinking that of that as that I will never feel any better than I feel right now. But cure doesn't mm-hmm. mean that, you know. Uh, so, pe- I mean, chronic illness is the fact of life for a majority of human beings, actually, uh, various chronic illnesses, but it doesn't mean that they, they feel bad all the time. I mean, and just as yeah. a funny, funny example of that, um, you know, like chicken pox, that virus stays within us for our entire life. We're never cured of it, but we're not suffering from the outward symptoms. So that's, it's just mm. important that we remember, you know, what does cure really mean? I think people in their mind are thinking, they just want to know, am I going to feel better? And that is possible for most everybody. Yeah, definitely. And and I think it, uh, I know myself when I was at the worst and feeling pretty miserable with uh with the state of health that I was in, um all you want is for it to go away. You just don't want to feel like that anymore. So if not feeling like that at that at the height of the illness is is uh something that can change, then anything from there feels good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd like to backtrack now and just talk about SIBO itself. You know, what is SIBO? Okay. In so, very layman terms. Okay. It's just an accumulation of the normal bacteria that normally live in our digestive tract. It's an accumulation of them in the small intestine. And so for people who don't know the anatomy of the small intestine, uh, we start with the mouth then the esophagus, the stomach. After the stomach comes the, comes the small intestine and it's very long. Um, and, you know, coils around in our abdomen. Then after that comes the large intestine, which is also called the colon. And while it's wider, it's much shorter, and it just has three segments. Um, and then and then that's the end of the tract where the stool comes out of. So normally the large intestine has bacteria. Most people are familiar with that. We have good bacteria and just normal bacteria that don't cause us any disease. Lots of them living in our large intestine. They do good things for us. So um, sometimes what can happen is those bacteria that are down below can come up into the small intestine. And also bacteria are constantly entering into our digestive tract through our mouth and our nose just as we breathe and as we swallow and as we eat and drink because bacteria are 
coating everything everywhere. <laughs> we just live in a world mm-hmm. with lots of bacteria. So they come in and um, they normally will just pass down and through the small intestine. But uh, th- there can be reasons why they then wouldn't pass through. So they can accumulate from above as well. So it's when bacteria are accumulated in the small intestine. We call it an overgrowth. Um, sometimes we call it a colonization. And that's improper. They shouldn't They shouldn't be there in large numbers. And And the body actually has many, many protections and mechanisms to make it so that the bacteria pass through the small intestine. And the reason it's trying to do that is because the small intestine is where we break apart and absorb our food. Breaking apart is digestion. Breaking apart the food is digestion. And then absorbing is taking it into into the rest of our body. And so to, to do those functions, uh, we don't want bacteria around because they they do those same things for themselves. And basically, they would compete and try and digest and absorb our food. And that's what they do when we have SIBO. So the, the body doesn't want that to happen. It doesn't want that bacterial competition for our food. So they shouldn't be there. So, so just in summary, it's too many bacteria in the wrong location. Sure. And what causes uh, that to occur? There are, um, there are a lot of causes or I also call them risk factors. Um, but it might be easier to think of it first as what the underlying causes are, the things that go wrong in the body. And there's just, mm-hmm. just a few of those. Um, it's basically when those protections against it fail. And so some of the most common would be a deficiency of motility. And it's a certain kind of motility called the migrating motor complex that happens in the small intestine itself. Most people are familiar with um, you know, having a bowel movement. That's a form of motility that happens from the large intestine. And also we're familiar with the concept of peristalsis, which is where food is um, pushed down through the digestive t- tract as it's getting absorbed. This is something a little different. It's a, a strongly propulsive movement that just happens right in the small intestine. Sometimes we can feel it as those um, hunger pains, like we, we hear sort of a gurgling, it kind of moves, we feel it. Yeah, and you don't, it can be happening and you don't hear those hunger sounds, but that is a sign of it. So um, what that function is, it's meant to actually, it happens, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> backtracking here, it happens when we don't eat. So it happens between our meals and then overnight when we're sleeping. And its function is to clear the small intestine of bacteria and any sort of indigestible food residue. It's, it's basically like, uh, washing the dishes after eating. It's just, it's called a housekeeper wave. It's tidying up, making sure everything is smoothed mm-hmm. out. And so this is really the number one way people get it is this migrating motor complex doesn't work very well, becomes deficient or it works improperly. So that's, that's probably the number one way. The second most common way or cause of getting SIBO would probably be some sort of structural problem, like, for instance, a partial obstruction. Some some other piece of anatomy might be pushing in on the small intestine, blocking the clear passage of the bacteria. Or um, or maybe there's um, an adhesion, which is like a scar band, either within the small intestine or wrapped around it, kind of squeezing it. And then once again, the passage through gets blocked. Um, and there are other structural things that can happen, but those are probably the two most common underlying causes of SIBO. Another one that, um, well, two more that are, that are, that are sort of have a lot of press is um, Mm -hmm. for people who know about it would be a deficiency of stomach acid. The hydrochloric acid in the stomach kills bacteria. And so that can kill the bacteria that comes in. And if we take proton pump inhibitors, um, or if we just happen to have low stomach acid, uh, then the bacteria aren't killed and then they can spill over into the small intestine and possibly accumulate. Now, this one is a debatable underlying cause. And here's another debatable underlying cause. It would be the ileocecal valve. This is the valve that separates the small and the large intestine. It's um, it's like a sphincter and it's closed at most times and then it opens to allow the passage of contents through. But if it's open all the time, then the bacteria from the large intestine would be able to move upward into the small intestine more easily. This one's also a little bit debated because the idea is that if you have your migrating motor complex working well, then both of those avenues of having bacteria accumulate technically, they really should be overcome because if you have spillover from above or migration of bacteria up from below, wouldn't the downward current of the migrating motor complex just push it out. And there are studies to show that that's, that that's true. So we're still all trying to figure out how does, how do these all work together? Which one's the most important? 
important and you know mm. and that sort of thing. It's not clear, but we do we do know that these are the underlying causes. Now just let me skip over to the causes or risk factors for a minute. I mentioned proton pump inhibitors. So if we think of what actually causes the underlying causes, those the deficiency of the migrating motor complex or structural abnormality, we can class those into some categories like diseases, drugs, uh, lifestyle factors, surgery, maybe genetics, things like that. So proton pump inhibitors would be in the class of drugs. They can lower the uh, stomach acid. Uh, opioid narcotic painkillers that people might get prescribed after a surgery, those slow motility throughout the whole GI tract, so they can decrease the migrating motor complex. That's actually a very common way people can get SIBO because um, because the motility slows down and bacteria accumulate. And then when they stop taking mm. the drug, their motility might come back but they have this accumulation now that is might be a little hard to clear. Sometimes people, sometimes it will clear on its own over time, and then sometimes people will need treatment for that. Um, surgery is another one where it's very common to get adhesions, little scar scar bands um, after abdominal surgery, and if those adhesions form in such a way that they compress the small intestine, that can be a way to get SIBO. So I'm just giving examples. Now, here's probably the most common way would be food poisoning, which is also known as stomach flu or traveler's diarrhea. Mm -hmm. This is the most common way it's thought for people to get SIBO is that they get about a food poisoning. And then what happens is there's a top now, now food poisoning is caused by pathogenic bacteria, not the normal bacteria that accumulate in SIBO. These are different. These are pathogenic bacteria that come in and cause acute illness and then leave. <laughs> so when they come in, they secrete a toxin that can trigger our immune system to um, actually damage some of our small intestine nerve cells because the toxin looks like our small intestine nerve cells. So kind of like your friendly fire or a mistaken identity, our immune system can damage these nerve cells. And the nerve cells that it damages are the ones responsible for the migrating motor complex. Now, this um, this thing I just mentioned here is actually phenomenal information that has only been really recently fully discovered and published. It's, so we have new learning here on how, how come a lot of people get SIBO, and this seems to be the number one cause. So, so those are some of the underlying mm. causes and some of the risk factors. Um, I, I actually didn't mention a lot of the diseases, so let me just briefly mention that. There are diseases sure. that slow motility like diabetes can and scleroderma and cystic fibrosis and even hypothyroid. Hypothyroid is pretty famous for causing constipation. It can also slow motility in the small intestine. So, and hypothyroid is very common. Of course, you can treat the hypothyroid and then the motility gets better, kind of like coming off the opioid drug. But so there are all kinds of ways people can get SIBO from, from drugs they're taking temporarily, from drugs they're taking long term, from diseases that might be incurable, like scleroderma, um, or diseases that might be curable. Um, and from lifestyle factors and things like that, and surgery. So all sorts of ways can cause SIBO. Really, there's so many ways. It's, it gets to be a huge list because there are so many ways that we can disrupt those underlying protections. But then it's good to remember that what is really underlying it is just a few things, like deficiency of the migrating motor complex or some sort of maybe partial destruction. What are some of the risk factors uh, when it comes to lifestyle that can contribute to SIBO? Uh, that would really be the main one I'm thinking of there is besides the um, the drugs that people take, that's kind of a lifestyle factor, um, is stress. And the way stress can affect SIBO is uh, because it can decrease stomach acid production and also it can decrease the migrating motor complex. So it can decrease that positive motility in the small intestine. Now, can stress in and of itself cause SIBO? Could it be enough? I have heard of some situations where there are people who had uh, acute stress that it did seem to cause SIBO. And I've also heard of a couple of situations where people had very severe chronic stress, and we think that's what caused it. Um, now, one, one other mm-hmm. thing I, I can say on that is that In most of those situations, except for maybe one or two, people did have other risk factors. And so that's, again, where we wonder how much needs does it need to be a combination. But one thing we can say is it's never going to be bad for someone to reduce their stress, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
So it's not and, really like the primary cause, but it's it's an important factor. Yeah, definitely. And when I think about my own journey, I had so many elements of that uh, that I believe could have contributed to to SIBO, like um, food poisoning, and I had parasite infections. I've got endometriosis. I've had abdominal surgery. Um, I've had a lot of stress in my life. Uh, is it is it a case of that these things can just layer on top of each other, and until then you have. SIBO or is there one defining moment that is the cause of SIBO in your in your opinion? I have seen it both ways. Um, I have absolutely seen both ways. There are lots of people who they just like you, they tell me each one of those, uh, almost every single one of those things you mentioned is a big enough risk factor in and of itself to cause people SIBO. But yet it, it not any one of them caused it. Like, you know, you might have had one, then another. So I see that a lot. It's like all these risk factors stack on top of each other. And then there's just the straw that broke the camel's back. And you're not Mm. even really sure, you know, I guess that was just the last trigger. Um, And particularly Mm. with food poisoning, that can happen because studies have shown that damage to those nerves is cumulative. Most people have had multiple bouts of food poisoning, you know, at least three for most people. And the damage can can keep accumulating. So the nerves function might go down and then go down a little bit more. And then the last time it's low enough, it slows the migrating motor complex enough that now you get SIBO. So Mm. that's one way. But then I've also seen it the other way. I've seen it where somebody had perfect gastrointestinal health, never a problem in their life. They went traveling in a third world country. They got traveler's diarrhea, food poisoning, and bam, that was it never well since they, they got their SIBO. So it, so it happens in all kinds of ways. Mm. And I look at my journey and, and my uh, digestive health, I can now look back on and, uh, and see was pretty compromised from almost from the start, but it just got progressively worse with every occurrence of, you know, risk factor occurring until it then got unbearable and I couldn't ignore it any longer. So I, I suspect for myself, I had SIBO for a very long time, but I was able to tolerate it to an extent for many years before I then decided this, I can't live like this anymore. Um, And I think that Oh, sorry. You bring sorry, a, no. a really good point go. because um, there's a spectrum of severity of SIBO. And I think it's true that a lot of people have a milder form of SIBO and they're not even really knowing that they have something wrong. Like they, they sort of know, but it's just an, an annoyance. And that's that could be SIBO just in a milder form, you know, versus then it gets worse and worse. And then finally, it's just the unbearable point. So I do see I do see people with stories like that, where I think they probably had a mild form for a long time and it progressively got worse. And, you know, it's unfortunate because if we can treat it in the mild form, it's a lot easier to, you know, Mm. to handle. Mm. Yeah. So I'd like to talk a a little bit about the symptoms that you see commonly with SIBO and what people, uh, perhaps if someone's listening to this podcast who hasn't received a diagnosis of SIBO, um, but is interested to know whether maybe some of the symptoms they're experiencing might be associated with the condition. Okay, so the, the main symptoms are abdominal bloating, abdominal pain or discomfort. It doesn't have to be pure pain. And either constipation or diarrhea or a mixture of the two. Those are the core mm-hmm. symptoms. And the, the bloating, sometimes that's called distension. Um, but what we're talking about here are really just sort of two things. One is when physically the abdomen swells out like a balloon or looking like pregnant. And the other part is a feeling that the abdomen is swelling out. And sometimes people can have that feeling without the physical swelling, and that is still a part of it. Um, And then often they go together. And would that be a feeling of um, fullness even if you haven't eaten for a while? Is that what you're referring to? um, It could be interpreted that way. It's it's actually, um, it's more of a sensation as if the belly was outstretched. Um, mm. even if you look in the mirror and it's not, there, that's a, a feeling. That, that feeling is actually called bloating. Technically, medically, that's what bloating is. And the physical swelling medically is called distension. Uh, but 
nobody uses those terms really. We all just say bloating to mean this actual swelling and then the feeling is sort of a secondary thought. Yeah, and I think so. anyone that suffers from bloating, especially visible bloating, they know exactly what that is because it's embarrassing and it's uncomfortable. And um, as a woman, uh, and Alison, I know that you've said this and I very much experienced this, it can often render you looking pregnant uh, when you're not, which I don't know that there's many people that want to walk around looking <laughs> pregnant when, <laughs> when, they're not. when they're not actually pregnant. Oh, it's <laughs> terrible for your self-esteem. It can be terrible for your libido and your sex drive. And and just on and on it goes. And also men, you know, have the same thing. And they say, I look seven months pregnant. I mean, maybe it's even worse for a man <laughs> to look <laughs> pregnant. Right? So yeah. it's pretty awful. What so, are some of the less known symptoms with SIBO? So, you know, a whole constellation of symptoms goes with it. Those are the core symptoms. But almost always what goes with it is food intolerance, food sensitivity, because the symptoms are most often caused by eating. So um, mm. people react to all kinds of foods and have a terrible time. They get their symptoms from food. So another symptom that can come with that, honestly, we don't speak a lot about is fear of food. Um, mm. And this is like a conditioned response. You know, sometimes um, when we're trying to expand people's diet, you know, the practitioner might want to say to the person, don't be afraid. It's time to uh, to expand and try things. But that's a little insensitive because it's a conditioned response. It's like you eat something, it causes you pain or horrible diarrhea. You're not going to want to eat it, you know. So, so it takes time. Yeah. To eat to get over that fear as a person heals and gets better. And another sort of mental thing or emotional that can come with it is anxiety. Now, sometimes depression comes with, but more often I see anxiety and I don't, um, I don't think that this is, I mean, there's an obvious level of um, emotional upset that comes with, with these symptoms of having symptoms and being ill or chronically ill. But actually, um, I'm talking more about an anxiety that seems to be produced, I think, from bacterial, uh, bacterial metabolites. Um, I think the lipopolysaccharides, or that, another word for that is endotoxin, I think one of their effects is to, is to cause anxiety um, through the gut-brain axis. So that symptom can come with mm -hmm. And then we have a whole constellation of other um, of, of other GI symptoms. For instance, um, excessive burping or farting. Uh, there can be uh, food feeling like it sits in the stomach and won't go down, um, or mm -hmm. there can be nausea, sometimes vomiting, although that's not that common. Um, and there can be acid reflux. That's very common. Uh, yep. And then, of course, fatigue. Um, it's a very fatiguing illness for various reasons. Bloating in and of itself is quite fatiguing. Um, mm -hmm. Diarrhea is, uh, can be very fatiguing due to electrolyte um, and fluid loss. And many of the other, other symptoms are too. So, um, and, and then one other thing is, is that it, SIBO can cause leaky gut. So one of the main symptoms of leaky gut is reacting to foods again, but this time with uh, systemic symptoms like headache or nasal mucus or skin rash, uh, joint pain, things like this. So, so that can be a part of SIBO as well. Mm, definitely. And I, like I, I look at my own experience and I used to break out in hives, very itchy, hot hives after certain foods. I would have headaches. I was often quite phlegmy and mucousy and I had really strong back pain for a long time, for many years. And when I treated my SIBO, that all disappeared. Yep, that's if you come. You had it all. Dang. I had it all. <laughs> that was the textbook case. Yeah. And then there's one other thing to think about here. So, you know, these are sort of the, the core symptoms, then the sort of constellation symptoms. But, and you were probably going to ask me about this anyway, but there's a whole host of diseases that are associated with SIBO that aren't necessarily gastrointestinal. I mean, any gastrointestinal disease can have SIBO along with, and one may cause the other or the other may cause the other one. But there are conditions that it might be helpful for people listening to know are associated with SIBO, like, for instance, acne and acne rosacea, so rosacea, and restless leg mm -hmm. syndrome, and prostatitis, and interstitial cystitis. These are some actually classic um, 
uh, conditions that seem to go with SIBO, and we don't know the exact reason why, um, and even rheumatoid arthritis. So if somebody listening has any of those symptoms, uh, the idea here is that if you've tried treatment for those conditions, standard treatment for those conditions, and it has failed, you may want to look into SIBO because studies show that when SIBO is treated in these uh, diseases that are associated, the original disease gets greatly improved. Like, for instance, restless legs uh, syndrome, the study showed an 80% improvement when the SIBO was treated. Wow. And I wish I had known that so many years ago. I remember as a child, I used to want to rip my legs and feet off because they were so irritating to me. And then when I was 11 and I hit puberty, I developed the most extreme acne, which took, um, I spent years and I now know um, how damaging it was for my gut health, but I spent years and years on antibiotics with the doctors using antibiotics as a treatment option for my um, acne. Uh, and it wasn't until I was 16 and I went on a very strong drug called Roaccutan that, that cleared my acne up. But I look at what, you know, it was almost like a holocaust for my digestive <laughs> health at that time with all those years of, of antibiotics um, in an attempt to clear up a condition which possibly, you know, I could have been treating my SIBO then and, and would have seen a huge uh, improvement in my condition for both less restless leg and acne. Yes, and if people want the full list of that, um, uh, I didn't even mention uh, my actual website um, uh, call number, but it's SIBOinfo.com. And on there, there's a section for associated diseases. And you can see the full list. And I have the studies linked. So if you want to look at them or have your doctor look at them, you can see everything. Yeah, great. And and that link is also in the show notes. Um, so, Alison, talk to me about how you can test for SIBO. So if someone suspects that they've got SIBO, they're matching up with some of the symptoms that you've talked about, what next? Well, the test that most people do uh, is the SIBO breath test. There is another test that it can be used to diagnose SIBO, and that's a small intestine culture. But that's invasive. You do it with an endoscopy. It's like an um, in-office procedure, with, usually with some anesthesia. Not always, but this is much simpler, and it's the main test that's used to diagnose SIBO. So it's a hydrogen and methane breath test, and the best will be three hours long. And there are different um, sugars, basically, that you drink. And the idea of that is you, you drink these sugars that are meant to feed the bacteria in the small intestine because then they will uh, transform those into gas. It will eat them and make gas. And then that gas, some of it, will diffuse across into our lungs and will expire it out. We can collect the breath and then see how much gas was there. So, oh, excuse me. So um, the sugars, there are two main sugars that are used. One is glucose and one is lactulose. And that's lactulose, not lactose. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, have, they both have pros and cons. Most physicians I know tend to use lactulose because it is non-absorbable, meaning it's going to traverse the whole small intestine and be able to feed and reach and feed the bacteria that might be lower down throughout the whole small intestine. Whereas glucose is absorbed within the first two to three feet of the small intestine. So it can only diagnose SIBO that's in the top two or three feet of the small intestine. Mm. It, does, it does a very, very good job at identifying SIBO because um, it basically it, it won't have any false positives because, it, because bacteria love glucose. So if they eat it, you will see it, you will know that you have SIBO. But the unfortunate thing is then you're missing the bottom like 18 feet <laughs> Small yeah. <laughs> so probably the best option of all would be to do a glucose and a lactulose, but that takes a little more time and a little more money. So um, what a lot of people do, what most people do is they just choose lactulose because it will cover the whole small intestine. And the other thing that's quite important is to be sure that um, both hydrogen and methane gas are being tested for um, with the lab that you're using because there are some machines that are older that don't test methane or there are some physicians that aren't um, up, fully up to speed on the most uh, recent research and don't know you you really need to represent the methane. So their machine might test it, but they don't even record it. So that's the key. And three hours is the last piece that's quite important because um, that really helps us with distinguishing another gas that we cannot actually test for, which is called hydrogen sulfide. 
there's no um, currently no commercial test for that, but we can get a good sense of it by seeing what happens in the third hour of the test. So that's the test. Right. And why is it important that you, that you are seeing both hydrogen and methane um, results in the test? It's important because um, it, it changes your treatment and it also changes the prognosis or um, how easy we think it's going to be to treat, how long this might go on. It really informs us about the whole situation and particularly the treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, and and, and so is one, uh, and you're probably about to answer this, is yeah. one uh, more difficult to treat than the other? That's just what I was going to say. Methane is harder. Methane is harder to treat and harder to get rid of, and it's tricky. And uh, very often when I when I inform people that they have methane and it's trickier to treat and a little harder, they'll go, yeah, I could have told you that already. <laughs> they, <laughs> a lot of them are already familiar with, uh, intimately familiar with their condition, and they know when they've got a tricky case, you know. So um, it really helps. It really helps the physician manage the treatment when we have the test. Um, And then if I might just say why testing in general is a good idea um, is because the symptoms, the core symptoms that I mentioned, um, bloating, pain, constipation, or diarrhea, these are nonspecific symptoms. They're very common symptoms that can happen from a multitude of reasons and conditions. So there are about 35 or 40 other common conditions that can cause those exact same symptoms. So who's to say, if we just try and treat based on symptoms, who's to say you don't have one of those other 35 or 40 conditions? We we need to diagnose it, especially if our treatments are going to be antimicrobial in nature, whether we're using what what we believe is to be kinder, gentler treatments like herbs or not, um, I think if we're going to be altering someone's microbiome with antimicrobials, we should be sure that that is called for. A common example I like to give of the of this difference of what my, a person might have would be lactose malabsorption or lactose intolerance. Uh, many people do have genetic uh, primary lactose intolerance and don't know it. They really have not linked their symptoms with the con- consumption of lactose-containing dairy. Um, There are actually studies on this to show the prevalence of how how much people link it or don't link it. Um, Mm -hmm. And a a lot of people don't. And so if that was the problem, the, the, the underlying cause there is a deficiency, a genetic deficiency of an enzyme, not a bacterial overgrowth. So the Lactose intolerance can have the exact same symptoms. So let's just say you bomb someone with antibiotics or the kindler, what we think the kindler, gentler herbal antibiotics, but you're not treating the right thing because there's not a bacterial overgrowth. There's just a deficiency of an enzyme. So it's not the proper treatment. So we really need, um, we need the test to diagnose the condition and inform us of our treatment. Yeah, and, and that moves us uh, nicely on to what are the treatment options for SIBO? Okay, so there's four main treatment options. There's diet, there's antibiotics, pharmaceutical antibiotics, there's herbal antibiotics, and then there's elemental diet. So those are the four main treatments. And what I would say there is that diet is a bit of a sort of a supplementary treatment to the other three, which are kind of like killing strategies, more really going after killing and eliminating the bacteria, where the diet... um, the diet is useful to support all of those and very much to help symptoms, but it doesn't seem to be the best at just truly eliminating the bacteria the way that the others are. So with regards to antibiotics and herbal supplements, um, is there a, a time when you would use one over the other or together? Would you use one for, say, hydrogen or one for methane? I'm really interested to know when you choose um, what type of uh, herbal or antibiotic treatment to choose for a patient. Okay, so um, I find that all three of those killing strategies are equally effective. Um, And so really it just comes down to the pros and cons of each one and sort of customizing it to the person you have in front of you, to the the individual. Um, So ways that we might choose are things like philosophy, first and foremost. Um, There are people who don't ever want to take another pharmaceutical antibiotic and won't do it, and they want herbs. Okay, so then we choose that. Um, There are people who have tried herbs and react terribly to them. 
And so then we choose pharmaceutical antibiotics. Um, it's really just an individual case by case thing. Once you know that they are equally effective, then it's just all the pros and cons. Another thing is time. Um, antibiotic course is usually two weeks. Herbal course is usually four weeks. There are some people that might make the decision based on that. Like, for instance, they have an important event coming up. I've had patients that have a wedding or a certain thing coming up, and they really want to get some treatment under their belt before the event. Um, things like that. Now, um, typically, the patients that I see need multiple rounds of one of the three, you know, antibiotics, herbal antibiotics, or elemental diet, to um, to successfully treat their SIBO. And, and that's because... It's not like a like what we think of, say, a urinary tract infection, where uh, you take a course of antibiotics and then it completely goes away and you're all better, unless you happen to have the chronic type of relapsing urinary tract infections, but that is um, less common. Well, with SIBO, it seems to be more common to not get it handled with one round of treatment. Uh, just because there's just probably so many bacteria in there, there's only so much the treatment can do. What I find is that I, I use all three methods with most of my patients. You know, we might start with herbs and then we go to antibiotics and then eventually elemental diet, or we do, you know, two rounds of antibiotics and then we do two rounds of herbals. So for me, I'm, I just use everything. Um, you have to question though, might we combine them? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we combine an antibiotic with an herbal antibiotic. Uh, most often I don't. Most often I just do pharmaceutical antibiotics and then herbal antibiotics. An elemental diet is something you do. Um, I should just, maybe I should just describe what it is. It's, um, it's a medical food. And so what it is, is it either comes in a powder form or a premixed liquid form. And it's, it's the nutrients that we would need, um, that we would get from food, but in their most broken down or mostly broken down form. So the, it's protein comes as amino acids. And then fat um, is not actually too broken down. It comes as oil. And then the carbohydrate comes usually as a monosaccharide. So the most broken down, simple form of carbohydrate, like glucose, um, for example. Sometimes it's a little longer chain, something called maltodextrin. And then we have all the vitamins and minerals in there as well, and plus some salt for electrolytes. So it's basically everything you, you nutritionally should be getting from your food, but broken down at, um, in the form of medical food. And so you either mix the powder with water or you uh, take the, pre, the pre-mixed drink. And the idea behind it is that it feeds the person, but it starves the bacteria because it absorbs quickly up high in the small intestine before getting a chance to feed the bacteria. And so the bacteria die from starvation. So in this method, and and by the way, it's done for usually two weeks, like how pharmaceutical Mm -hmm. antibiotics are. And within that time frame, it, it seems to be very effective. One thing that's quite special about elemental diet is that it's able to reduce a high level of gas or bacteria that makes that gas in one two week course, whereas the pharmaceutical antibiotics and the herbal antibiotics, they they can't reduce gas as much in their courses. So we often will choose um, elemental diet for somebody that has high gas. It's another reason why it's good to have the test because it informs which of the choices you're going to make. We'll use that for them. And then in two weeks, we might be able to get, you know, gas as high as 150 down to negative in one, two week course. So, um, so, but back, where was I, where was I going with this, with the different, oh yes, I know, I've remembered. Um, elemental diet is not done with antibiotics or herbal antibiotics because the bacteria sort of go into a hibernation mode and um, the, they need to be replicating for the mechanism of action that antibiotics and herbal antibiotics have. So it's sort of just a useless to do them with. So we don't combine that with anything else. Mm, okay. And that, that leads me on to my next question, which is around, should you be uh, having a restricted diet whilst using herbs or antibiotics, or should you be eating to feed the bacteria to allow them to uh, produce and multiply so that then the herbs and, and antibiotics can uh, attack them while they're in full force? Well, there's differing opinions on this. So um, Dr. Pimentel, the lead researcher on SIBO, he likes the idea of feeding them. And so that's the way he does it. Um, I, I'm not so keen on that idea. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just, 
just because of patient feedback that I've had, um, I think that that might be a, a good way to do it for someone who has not yet gone on a restricted carbohydrate diet, um, which is which is what the diets that treat SIBO are all about. They restrict carbohydrates. So if you're just new to treatment, I would say don't alter your diet um, while you're doing your antibiotic treatment. But um, then as you start to finish the treatment, begin to get get yourself on a diet. And that way you can mm. take advantage of Dr. Pimentel's idea. But what I wound up seeing is people who had been on a restricted carbohydrate diet then added high carbohydrates uh, to their treatment to see if that would help when they heard him discuss this. And um, I got very negative feedback on that. Um, people saying that it seemed to be less effective than when they did the low-carb diet. And since then, I've talked to a lot of my fellow practitioners about it. And um, I've seen that echo. Sure. And I think that's such an important point to make that this isn't a one-size-fits-all treatment or or even condition. It's it's completely uh, unique to us as individuals because our microbiome is unique to us. Yes. Yeah. Um, one thing, because, I mean, unless you're on your, the elemental diet, which is a liquid diet, the rest of us are eating food every day. And I know that there's some confusion around which diet to choose from. You know, there's the uh, specific carbohydrate diet, there's a low FODMAP diet, there's the GAPS diet, there's the fast track diet, there's the biphasic diet. What's your um, advice um, or approach when it comes to people choosing a particular uh, diet protocol to follow? Well, my main advice is to just choose one, is to just pick one um, and not worry too much about it. Pick whatever one you're drawn to. I don't even really care. Just pick one and then start customizing it to you. Uh, because all of those diets, they all are targeting and reducing carbohydrates, which is the general point. But the problem is that what, which carbohydrates are going to be aggravating are going to be different, most aggravating are going to be different from one person to the next. And so there is no diet that, that can be written on a page that can predict that. So that's why, in a way, it almost doesn't even matter. Just pick one um, and then begin customizing it. Now, the problem there is if you're following a diet and they have rules uh, saying, you you know, you must eat this and you are not allowed to eat that, you have to be actually willing to break those rules to be able to modify the diet to you successfully. So I would say pick any diet and then Break, break the rules to find out what really works for you and doesn't work for you. Now, I have other, other advice I can give, but that's my main advice. Don't sweat it, basically. Yeah. And I think it can be so uh, so easy to fall into the trap of really sweating it because especially if you've been sick for a long time and you've been reacting to foods for a while, um, you can become and I know I was a little bit obsessive over what you're consuming. Um, so I really like your advice of don't sweat it. <laughs> Just now, find yeah. what works for you. Now, I can say some other advice for people who are really suffering is, um, and a lot of people will just come come to this on their own, is the more you can reduce carbohydrates, the, the less carbohydrates you can eat, the better you will feel, the better the symptom control. And that is because carbohydrates are the primary food for bacteria. And then they take that and they make gas out of it, and the gas produces the symptoms. All of those symptoms we talked about actually can come from gas. So um, mm. there, are, there are other factors involved. There's the underlying cause um, generating symptoms and some other things. But predominantly, the symptoms come from bacteria eating carbohydrates. So, um, so any diet... And what are the carbohydrates that people could, that you can sort of... Uh, oh, yeah. list off for people that they could go, oh, yes, I am eating that. Oh, I didn't oh, yeah. realize that was a carbohydrate necessarily. Okay, yep. It might, might even be easier. I'll start with but saying what isn't carbohydrates. So um, sure. car carbohydrates are the hugest category of food. So protein is meat, um, any kind of meat, fish or fowl, um, eggs, and, um, and uh, dairy like uh, cheese. That's sort of concentrated protein. Um, now there are other foods that have protein in them, but those are those are protein foods. Now fats are going to be um, oils, and then there's fat in other like protein foods, like there's fat in eggs and there's fat in meat. And then the carbohydrates is a huge category. So this is vegetables, fruits, 
all grains. So grains would that means any baked good or bread or you know any anything like that, um, cereal, granola, etc. Um, nuts, seeds, beans or legumes, um, and then there's and then it's any sweetener any sugar or sweetener, and the natural sugars that exist in certain foods like the lactose sugar that's in milk, so dairy, Mm -hmm. a lot of dairy products that have lactose, that's the carbohydrate, and even the um, natural um, saccharides that exist in, uh, there's some in animal parts, and particularly that gets concentrated when we make broth, like bone broth, it's, it's mostly concentrated in the cartilage. So if you eat, like, say, um, if you have ribs and you make it in a crock pot, that might bother someone's symptoms because there's a lot of uh, mm. saccharide in the cartilage or bone broth, something like that. So, mm-hmm. so it's, a, it's the largest category of foods. It's the foods that people tend to most crave and enjoy <laughs> and yep. use as their reward in life. So it just sucks. You know, it's like... Thank you very much for giving this, uh, you know, condition that takes away these lovely foods or, or uses these, you know, have these foods cause symptoms. So, so just the general tip is if someone's really suffering, um, it, reducing as many of those foods as possible will help symptoms. I, you know, back to your question of what to do during treatment, I generally favor um, following a diet that helps your symptoms during the other mm-hmm. treatments. Um, and that can take time to figure out. Um, and then, you know, other, so that just going on that advice, I would say that um, the diet that I sort of compiled of, of two diets, uh, low FODMAP diet and specific carbohydrate diet, I call it the SIBO specific food guide. I think that tends to be the most restricted on carbs and therefore it can give the best symptom relief. But you may not want to start with that if you're not in terrible suffering. Um, and by the way, Dr. Jacoby's biphasic diet is um, it's her version. It's a particular clinical version of the SIBO specific food guide. But if you're not mm. suffering terribly, you know, you might want to start with just SCD, um, uh, specific carbohydrate diet, or even low FODMAP. You know, there's a lot of ways to choose, but the end result is just be willing to modify it to you. And over time, you're going to figure it out. Yeah, definitely. And just moving on to uh, sort of the final question for the part one of the SIBO uh, interview with you, Alison. What do you see as some of the uh, biggest misconceptions around SIBO? There's there's two that I can think of. Um, one is that people tend to think eating a lot of carbohydrates, eating like a junk food diet or a poor, you know, heavily laden carbohydrate diet causes SIBO. And that just, I can't see a way that that can happen. Um, That's just not true to my knowledge. Uh, You'd need one of those underlying protections to fail first. And I I cannot imagine any way in which um, eating a carbohydrate rich diet could cause those to fail. And there are no studies on that. Nobody has ever felt that that's true. But yet, uh, I mean, experts who write, but yet people tend to think that they, oh, I gave it to myself because I ate a lot of potato chips. It's like, no, that's not going to do it. Um, And I think that's important to know, first of all, because so you don't blame yourself. Um, And second of all, to get accurate information about what really is wrong in your body so that you can better target it. Because just stopping to eat the potato chips isn't going to make it, you know, go away completely. Your symptoms will probably be reduced because now you're not feeding the bacteria and they're not making gas. But um, it's just not accurate. Yeah. Um, And people come up with, honestly, a lot of uh, sort of crazy ideas about how they think they got their SIBO because they haven't had education on the subject. And this includes a lot of practitioners and a a lot of doctors. If they haven't taken any courses, um, you know, good educational courses, they're just going to come up with wackadoodle ideas, you know. So it's kind of good to get grounded. The other other misconception I can think of is that, that the urine organic acid test can be used to diagnose SIBO, and it can't. It, it can give a reflection. Um, the urine organic acid test will show bacterial and also yeast metabolites in the intestines, but the problem with the test is that it can't distinguish small from large intestine. So um, it cannot diagnose SIBO. It, um, what you might be seeing could be in the large intestine. Now, it might be that your treatment is going to be the same depending upon um, depending upon what treatment you choose. 
Um, but it, it, it goes back to that question of what does, like, does the person have um, lactose intolerance? You know, we, I think it's really important to properly diagnose the condition. Mm, definitely. So we'll, we're going to uh, wrap up part one of the SIBO uh, uh, discussion with Dr. Alison Seebecker, but we will be back in part two talking more about um, how to find a practitioner, what happens if you're quite a sensitive uh, uh, patient and it's, it's you're finding treatment very difficult, and also some of the lifestyle pieces around uh, life with SIBO. So Alison, I'd like to thank you so much join us on um, part one of the SIBO podcast and uh, we look forward to speaking to you in part two. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed episode two of the Healthy Gut podcast with Dr. Alison Seebecker. If you would like a copy of the show notes uh, and any of the links that we discussed in today's show, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash SIBO. You will also be able to download a handy guide on SIBO causes, risk factors and associated conditions and diseases. So head to thehealthygut.co forward slash SIBO to download that for free. Now, I would love to hear your feedback on this show, so please do leave me a review in iTunes. And if you know anybody that might benefit from listening to this show, perhaps someone, a friend or family member that might be experiencing some of those typical SIBO symptoms and that it might help them to listen to this podcast and hear all about SIBO, please feel free to share it with them. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube. We're everywhere on social media platforms. So just look us up. Uh, we're The Healthy Gut. And as I said at the beginning of this podcast, this is a f- the first part of a two-part episode with Dr. Alison Seebecker. So do tune in to episode three, where we talk about how to find a practitioner how to build your own healthcare dream team, the role of probiotics in your treatment, and what to do when you react to everything, because that's the type of patient that Dr. Alison Seebecker sees quite frequently. We also talk about the uh, weight gain and weight loss that so many of us experience with SIBO. And then we finish on the five key pillars of health, awareness, nutrition, movement, mindset, and lifestyle. I look forward to seeing you on episode three with Dr. Alison Seebecker. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or the podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. If you would like to help support the continuation of this podcast, you can make a contribution at thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. With thanks to Julian Pryor from J Podcaster for the production and editing of this podcast. To learn more, head to jpodcaster.com. We would also like to thank Belinda Coombs for the original music score. To hear more of Belinda's music, head to soundcloud.com forward slash Belinda Coombs. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut.